Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered today, the Palawa people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the traditions and cultures of this land. Welcome to the 2018 Peter Underwood Peace and Justice Lecture. I would like to extend a special welcome to Frances Underwood, who is here with us today, and uh, her family, who are also here, as well as a number of visitors and our special guest, Professor Gillian Treats. This event is held biannually to commemorate the life, values and achievements of former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and Governor of Tasmania, Peter Underwood. Peter had a strong connection with the Friends School for many years. He served as the presiding member of the Board of Governors in the 1990s. In this time on the board, he guided the school through a difficult period, including the funding, uh, the fundraising and reconstruction of buildings which were deemed unsafe for students. His wife, Frances Underwood, who is here today, taught at the Friends School for 24 years, acting as the head of Morris for 14 years. Most of his children attended the school, and his legacy has continued today through his current descendants of friends. When preparing for this, I asked if there is anything about Peter that I should include. I was told that he used to say, we must all actively strive for peace on a daily basis. This is reflected in his 2014 Anzac Day address as Governor of Tasmania. He warned against the glorification of war, reflecting on the brutal reality of what Gallipoli is. He called for 2014 to be the year of peace, and for some of the money spent on the Anzac Festival, as he referred to it, to be diverted to the University of Sydney's Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies. Peter was also a passionate believer in the transformative power of education. The Peter Underwood uh, Centre for Educational Attainment continues his great work in this area. Whilst Peter wasn't a practising Quaker, it is made clear through his life's work that he embraced many of the Quaker values, in particular, peace, justice, service and education. In 2015, the Friends School hosted the first lecture as a way of honouring Peter's life. Today we are honoured to welcome Professor Gillian Triggs to present the third Peter Underwood Peace and Justice Lecture. Originally from England, Gillian completed a Bachelor of Laws at the University of Melbourne and in further studies, a Master of Laws and a Doctor of Philosophy. Through her busy career, Gillian has worked as a barrister and solicitor in Melbourne, consulted on international law and advised the Dallas Police Department on the Civil Rights Act. She then took on leadership roles such as the Director of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, Director of the Interest Institute for Comparative and International Law at the University of Melbourne, Dean of the University of Sydney Law School, and Charles Professor of International Law. Last year, Gillian completed her five-year appointment as the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission. In her time as President, she launched the 2014 National Inquiry into Children in Immigration Detention and advocated for the rights of refugees detained by the Australian Government on Manus Island and Nauru. This lecture marks an important step in our friendly conference journey, in which we, as a community, try to answer the question, what are Australia's obligation to refugees? Gillian's knowledge and experience in this field will provide a great insight into this issue. This year, Gillian was named the 2018 Humanist of the Year by the Council of Australian Humanist Societies. Please join me in welcoming Gillian to the Friends School. That's a lovely introduction, especially to Peter's work. It's a huge um, honour for me to uh, have been invited to give this, um, this lecture in honour of Peter Underwood. And I have, of course, been reading rather more about his remarkable career. Uh, his, his role as, of course, a trial advocate, chief justice and governor of the state. But most particularly, the fact that he spoke up in difficult times to emphasise the importance of peace. And he understood, I think, something that I think is critical to the issue that I'd like to talk about today, our individual responsibility for asylum seekers and refugees. He understood that 
human rights and breaches of human rights are probably one of the most important and effective global causes of conflict. And perhaps one of the examples that we're all very well aware of is, of course, the breach of human rights that underlies the position of the Rohingya people uh, in our region. Uh, the failure to provide um, citizenship to these uh, Rohingya people in the west of Myanmar over many decades is a, a root cause for about an estimated 800,000 fleeing to one of the poorest nations in the world, Bangladesh. So Peter Underwood understood the importance of human rights, he understood the importance of peace rather than conflict. Um, and I really admire his willingness to stand up um, and uh, to use that modern phrase, speak truth to power. Um, I think it's important that the students are over these few weeks looking at responsibilities to asylum seekers and refugees and about what we as citizens can do about it. Indeed, in my view, as citizens, we have a responsibility to speak up and even to act up. <coughs> Human rights are not for the faint-hearted. Uh, it can bring condemnation. Uh, it's difficult to deal with. Peter dealt with it, and in my own way, I've been trying to deal with it as well. My perspective is one that's informed not only by a moral, religious, or ethical view, but by international human rights law. Um, I am very pleased, of course, to come to Tasmania to speak about this subject. Uh, I came, of course, when uh, in Pontville, uh, children were being held at that time indefinitely in the detention centre. And I would have to say that of all places in Australia where children were held, uh, this was the, the most sympathetic, where the community wrapped around those children and helped them the best they could, along with their families, over the weeks and months that they were held. And we were always very grateful for that at the Australian Human Rights Commission. And of course, as you know, there are no more children and Pontville has been closed down. Well, today I'd like to speak, if I may, about the current factual situation and the legal obligations, because that is what informs my approach to this problem. The legal obligations on Australian, Australia and each of us as citizens <coughs> under the treaties to which Australia is a party. And then to think a little bit about what we can do uh, for the future. But in dealing with these questions, I'd like to remind us about Australia's compassion and humanity from the past. It's all very well to talk about the statistics and the law, and in the Human Rights Commission we produce report after report setting out uh, the position of asylum seeker children and their families, along with law which is fairly straightforward human rights law. But it doesn't always, and typically won't, move hearts and minds, particularly of governments cemented into policy positions. What does move hearts and minds are the stories of the personal and individual stories of individuals. And I thought I'd go right back to the 1930s. Uh, and I've been reading the correspondence between two families, one living happily in Australia, in Kolak, the other in, Germany, uh, in Vienna. Both were Jewish families, and in both, the fathers were medical practitioners in their local communities. And their relationship was established through their daughters as pen pals, in those days when people wrote letters to each other, don't think they do very much anymore. Uh, but this was a lovely relationship, very typical of the times. But eventually, those letters became ones where the parents were writing to each other, the Viennese family pleading for assistance to gain admission to Australia because it became increasingly clear from 33, 34, 35, right up to 39, that their lives would be at stake under Hitler's anti-Semitic laws. They pleaded for help in seeking visas to settle in Australia. Sadly, visas were denied to this family um, and they uh, died in Auschwitz and Dachau, only the daughter, the pen pal, reaching safety in Britain and, and the United States under a special program to protect uh, these children, those vulnerable children. But the Australian family was asked by the Australian government to explain why they would speak up so loudly and write so many letters to try to encourage um, the government to grant them a visa, uh, the, the Viennese family to grant them a visa to come to Australia. And the answer 
that the father gave was, it was from common compassion. Well, the question that I have is what has happened to that common compassion in contemporary Australia? How is it that after nearly five years, there are still about 130 children on Nauru, about 700 men detained for at least that period on Manus Island, about 1,300 typically men held in immigration detention centres in mainland Australia, and about 350 men on Christmas Island. It's also estimated to be about 25,000 asylum seekers now seeking a living in the Australian community whose claims to refugee status have yet to be assessed by our new Super Ministry of Home Affairs after a many year freeze on hearing their claims at all. Some have bridging visas, at best they will receive temporary protection visas once they've been through a so-called fast track process that's taking many years to complete, but they will never, according to government policy, supported by both major parties, but they will never be allowed to settle in Australia on even a permanent protection visa. Some are losing their accommodation and their new start allowance is now being cut back. They have very little prospect of obtaining work. We are building up a long-term problem, I think, for the Australian community because these people will forever be in a legal twilight zone. Well, one might ask, why should we be concerned about refugees who come to Australia without a visa? They've come using people smugglers, they've come in a way that the Australian government chooses to consider it illegal. I'd suggest that we all have a responsibility to asylum seekers and refugees, both at the level of law and our responsibility to them in particular, but also because the breach of law in relation to these people is a threat to all Australians. But let me explain why that is. UNHCR and other UN committees and rapporteurs have been unanimous in finding that Australia is in breach of its obligations under the Refugee Convention, a convention designed to deal with the very problem that we saw uh, in Australia in the 1930s and the need for some form of refuge for those subject to those laws in, in, uh, in fascist Germany. The Convention on the Rights of the Child is, in, is clearly being broken along with the Torture Convention and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Breaches of these laws threatens us all because there's been a growing willingness by our politicians to breach the, the rule of law in general. It appears to be supported by a majority of the community, but it has significant repercussions for our freedom of speech, for our right not to be detained without charge or trial by our peers, our right to a freedom of association, and also to guard against the unprecedented growth of executive discretion of ministers, and in particular through this new super ministry of home affairs. The ministerial discretion is neither compellable nor reviewable by the courts and represents a serious um, regression of respect for the rule of law in Australia. To put it in fairly simple terms, Let's think about the debate we've seen in the newspaper over the last few days. Does President Trump have a right to pardon himself? What's the answer? Clearly, no. We all know that. The Americans know it in their constitution. But what we are failing to understand is that one of the underpinnings of our legal system is break this, uh, 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 balancing and putting brakes upon the power of the executive. And we could go right back to the Magna Carta celebrating now more than 800 years, where bad King John was forced to put his uh, seal on those demands of the barons who challenged his view that he was supreme. The key point about the Magna Carta is that even the sovereign, the executive, is subject to the rule of law. This isn't the invention of a, of a post-Second World War uh, left-wing United Nations. This is a fundamental principle that underscores all of our, well, most legal systems in the world, but certainly our common law, Westminster democratic system. 
and buried in the middle of that Magna Carta, if you could take the time to go back and look at it, along with your responsibilities to your feudal lord, is and, and how many pigs and cows you can have and the content of a glass of wine and the breadth of a piece of cloth, in all of those rules is a provision right in the middle. No man may be detained arbitrarily without charge or trial by his peers. This is a fundamental principle, and yet it's a principle in our refugee policy that we are breaching frequently. We also, I think, have an extraordinary circumstance in which many of the institutions of our democratic government are now threatened by corruption and by abuse. We've seen the evidence in the Banking Royal Commission. We've seen the business world avoiding taxes yet calling for further tax deductions. We've seen the police faking breath tests. We've seen our political representatives failing to even read the Constitution and to understand about dual citizenship. We have a failure of Parliament itself to support human rights, and we have the passing of laws by complicit oppositions with government bodies, which explicitly breach even the fundamental principle of non-reformant in the Refugees Convention. You will all know that the fundamental principle in that Refugee Convention is that a person with refugee status may never be returned to the state where they are subject to persecution and to uh, um, intolerance uh, and often to death. And yet today we are sending back uh, Rohingya to Myanmar to face whatever um, they will be facing there in an environment in which they have no citizenship rights and are subject to uh, brutal repression. These are difficult environments in which we demonise welfare recipients, and I think the debate about women in relation to double dipping for maternity leave is a very good example of that. But we also have the extraordinary circumstance in which the considered consultation with our indigenous peoples and the Uluru statement from the heart has been dismissed really with almost no explanation by the federal government. Um, how is it that we've reached this Position. How have we moved from a compassionate and welcoming country to one where we promote the individual um, above the needs of so many in dire need of protection and support? Well, what I'd like to do is to explain why, in my view, the law has let us down and why Australia has become isolationist and exceptionalist in our approach to these problems of international legal compliance. And let me point up to a, a a comparison. You might recall that um, 18 months or so ago, the, United, the, um, the uh, Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea um, was faced with a challenge to the detention on Manus Island of, at that time, about 800 men. And the matter went through the normal, normal legal process. This was a case called Namar against Pato. Um, and it got to the, the, uh, the Papua New Guinea Supreme Court on the argument that the Papua New Guinea Constitution provides that no person shall be deprived of his personal liberty, an echo of the Magna Carta that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, and the, you, the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea decided unanimously that the deprivation of liberty jointly by the governments of Australia and Papua New Guinea on Manus Island was in clear breach of the Papua New Guinea Constitution, section 42, which specifically protects personal liberty. Now that led to the removal of those uh, um, asylum seekers in a formal detention centre to another detention centre effectively built by the Australian government. Not much effectively was achieved by it, but, what, but my point is that we have a unanimous decision of fine jurists in Papua New Guinea working with a modern constitution in 1975 to give effect to a principle that's fundamental to our common law legal system. But three months earlier, we had another decision by the Australian High Court that reached a very different view. This concerned, um, it was known as the M68 case, as many of these decisions don't use the names of the individuals concerned, but this concerned the Bangladeshi woman. She had arrived without a visa on a fishing boat, having paid a people smuggler. She was picked up at sea, rescued, she was detained on Christmas Island as an unlawful non-citizen under our Migration Act, and she was transferred to Nauru. She was pregnant 
and she gave birth to a daughter, mercifully allowed to do so in Brisbane um, shortly after. But she wanted to resist her return to what the United Nations has said are cruel uh, and inhumane facilities in breach of the Torture Convention on Nauru. She wanted to avoid going back with her child. And as the case came closer and closer through the legal processes to get to the High Court of Australia, it became very clear to the lawyers, to the public servants, and even ultimately to the minister himself, that the Migration Act did not permit the return of this woman to Nauru. There was no power that allowed government officials to forcibly remove people from Australia to, uh, to, to, to Nauru. And the government became aware of this defect in the Migration Act, but was determined to maintain its offshore uh, policy. So what, they, what did they do? They went back to the lawyers, my own profession, and said, we want you to fill this legal gap in the Migration Act. And they drafted a piece of law, technically <coughs> section 198 AHA2 of the Migration Act, which provided that the government official now was bound to transport that woman back to Bangladesh. And it was retrospective legislation which neatly covered the very period uh, of the, her detention, both at Christmas Island and Nauru and her time in Australia. Now that law, that amending law, was passed by Parliament with very little public discussion. But what it did, of course, was to allow her penalisation in, Papua New in uh, Nauru retrospectively in order to repair the position in the Migration Act. Well, the matter went to the High Court and six of the seven judges took pretty much the same view that the Migration Act, before it was amended, would not have allowed her return to Nauru. But once it was amended retrospectively, it now permitted her return. There was one judge that stood against that, Justice Gordon, uh, one of the three women on the High Court, and she said, this is wrong. We have what is known as the separation of powers. The judiciary is independent from the executive, and the executive is subject to the rule of law. We go back again to the principles of the Magna Carta and King John. And Justice Gordon said, only, can, only judges can impose penalties. Only judges can require her to go back to Nauru. The executive does not have that power under our constitution. And also, of course, you cannot have retrospective criminal or penal laws. She was the only judge to make that decision. All of the other judges said, no, Parliament has spoken. Parliament, the word of Parliament is sovereign. They represent the democracy of the people. And if this is what Parliament clearly intends, then that is what will happen. Now, the upshot then, of course, was she was deported, along with, of course, many others who provided then the legal basis for doing it. Now, I go into detail on those two cases for a very particular reason, and that is to say that we are operating in Australia in a very um, outdated constitutional and legal environment, whereas a country like Papua New Guinea that gained its independence in a period of great optimism and enthusiasm, I remember it well, in 1975, a modern document that includes the fundamental principles of common law freedoms. Why is there this difference? And let me explain why. We are the only country in Australia, the only country, democratic country in the world, and the only common law country in the world that does not have a Bill of Rights. And this means that our courts don't have the tools or equipment to reach the kind of decision that the Papua New Guinea Supreme Court was able to reach. But let's go back a little bit in time. I talked about the, the, the horror of the um, Jewish community in, in Vienna and the compassion of an Australian family uh, trying to support them. Well, in the, years, the year or so, just towards the end of the Second World War, a remarkable Australian, Dr. H. V. Ebert, some of you in the audience will remember this fasty, brilliant, I think somewhat annoying, very determined and opinionated lawyer 
who went to the Dumbarton Oaks in Washington to draft that inspirational document, and certainly a document that's informed my entire political career, the Charter of the United Nations. The point being in that charter that the rule of law and compliance with human rights law can prevent conflict. It was about how to achieve peace after the, in the aftermath of the horrors of the Second World War. And if you read that document, and I urge you to read the Charter, you'll see how strongly the Charter links compliance with human rights with avoiding conflict and war. That was the underlying premise of the Charter, and this man, Dr. Evert, was part of that. He was successful, and he was invited back by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1948 to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, this was something of an honour. Australia was barely um, uh, stretching its wings as a sovereign nation. And he went over and helped to draft some of those fundamental provisions of the Universal Declaration. But importantly, and sometimes we forget this, in 1948, he was the chair of the General Assembly of the United Nations. And under his presidency, uh, the Universal Declaration was passed without a single negative vote. And that's a legacy I think we owe to, Australia, uh, to, to Doc Evert. Um, but what it did was to set the foundation for all of the modern human rights law that we talk about. The Refugee Convention, um, which was designed to prevent the problem, of course, that uh, the Viennese Jewish family had in leaving their country uh, to provide refuge, but also the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Co Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Torture Convention, the Genocide Convention, all the way up to the mid-90s when Australia was a very strong leader in negotiating the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court. My point then is that from those days of Doc Evert all the way through to the 90s, Australia punched above its weight. We were good international citizens. We, I think, provided forces for just about every peacekeeping force ever, uh, had, that's ever been established in, 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 since 1947 and, the, and uh, the Palestine peacekeeping force that Australia was party to. We've really been um, a committed participant in the development of that human rights law. We've believed in it, regardless of your political persuasion, whichever party you might be part of. Across those party lines, we have always supported those treaties, and we've signed up to them. So it's been a remarkable uh, record, and we celebrate this year, of course, the 70th anniversary of the uh, Universal Declaration. But the great tragedy is that at least since 2001, we have been in regression from those principles of human rights law. Um, and we can date it, if you could ever put a line in the sand, and historians always have problems with this, but in 2001, you'll remember, we had some major events. The misstatement in this post-truth world, the misstatement that typically Islamic families in boats coming to Australia were throwing their children overboard in order to ensure that they were picked up and brought within Australian jurisdiction. The Senate, some months later, confirmed that there was no evidence whatsoever for that statement, but it was used by the politicians to generate, generate fear and to suggest that these were people not worthy of our protection and support. It was a disgraceful misstatement, a distortion of the facts, but it was important in the election that was held some few weeks later. A few weeks after that, a few months after that, we had that extraordinary Norwegian captain that brought the Tampa sailing into Melbourne waters Contrary to uh, government rejection of the right to come in, uh, but nonetheless he sailed that ship in right into the arms of a formidable judge in the federal court, Justice North, who essentially confirmed that Australia is bound by the Refugees Convention and we would abide by it. Those, those were heavy days, but within weeks of that, we had 9-11, the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers and Pentagon and the deaths of at least 3,000 Americans. A shocking year, but for Australia a pivotal year, because that was the year when our politicians started to speak in terms of fear, of protection of national borders, which of course as a sovereign nation we're entitled to do, but nonetheless to conflate people of the Islamic faith, people seeking our protection as asylum seekers, and terrorism and threats to our national sovereignty and to our national security.
and a willingness again across the political spectrum of people to use these sad plights of people seeking our protection um, uh, in the context of fear and national security. Just to return again to the law, despite that extraordinary history that I've given to you of us being good international citizens, for the most part, Australia never implemented those treaties in domestic law. Now, I realise that's a technical legal point, but I think you'll appreciate that as a diplomat, you cannot go overseas and ratify, or rather sign, and negotiate treaties. Those treaties do not have a domestic effect in Australia unless and until Parliament passes it into legislation. And we've done that in two major cases, the Race Discrimination Act in 1975 and the Sex Discrimination Act in 1984. Um, uh, by, very much led by a former colleague of mine, Susan Ryan, the first woman ever to be appointed to a Labour cabinet in the Hawke years. Remarkable achievements, but those are the only two pieces of legislation that have been introduced into Australian law subsequent to a convention. Another exception is the Disability Convention, but interestingly Australia led with that legislation before we had a convention. But my point then is that all, almost all of the treaties that I've mentioned have never been brought into domestic law. Extraordinarily, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is not part of Australian law directly. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that picks up the point about no arbitrary detention without charge or trial is not part of Australian law. It was part, however, of my jurisdiction as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission. So when I held the uh, uh, inquiry, and I think Sam very kindly um, mentioned that um, in the introduction, we held that inquiry on the basis of those international treaty obligations that were part of my statutory mandate. But when I went to see the minister or ministers saying, you cannot hold these children indefinitely without some proposal for assessing their claim to refugee status and durable settlement, because this is contrary to the obligations Australia has signed up to, and it's contrary to my mandate as President of the Human Rights Commission. And I would always get the same answer. That's very interesting, but it's not part of Australian law. Even the Refugee Convention, which in earlier years, parts of which had been implemented in Australia in the Migration Act, were two or three years ago stripped out of the Migration Act. So the definition of what is the refugee is not the definition that's in the Refugee Act, but it's defined by the Australian government at the discretion of the minister. This now expansive discretion that is too abstract an idea to really engage most Australians. But this is what is happening in Canberra and why I think we have to be eternally vigilant. So many of these treaties never became part of Australian law, but compounding the problem is the fact that we have a constitution that does not protect these rights. The constitution does very little for us other than deal with the practical aspects of trade and independence of the state and the Commonwealth and setting up respective powers. We do have a right to freedom of religious expression in the Constitution, um, and we have a right to judicial review. But we have no protection within the Constitution for the kinds of rights that were effective to the Papua New Guinea Supreme Court, looking at the Manus Island case. We have no provision of the right of the individual to liberty in our Constitution. So what happens in case after case is that, and the M68 one is, an, is a particular example of that, where the judges in the main, and there are exceptions, but in the main say, if Parliament has passed clear and unambiguous legislation, then the common law principles that we inherited from Magna Carta cannot um, apply. They will be ousted by the precise words of Parliament. And that is what is of great concern to me, that the common law rules can be overridden by Parliament. And I suggest, somewhat controversially, by no means do my colleagues agree with me, but I believe that Parliament, just as King John, Parliament is subject to the rule of law. And I'm not talking about the law or the particular piece of legislation. I'm talking about the principles of the common law that underlie the principles of legality. I do not believe that an opposition should be able to work with the government of the day to pass laws which are in breach of the fundamental common law rights in Australia. Um, I know it's a difficult point to, to, to make because people would say they represent the sovereignty of the people. But I believe even Parliament is subject to these common law principles. And I think it's something that is enormously important in an environment 
in which we have such a huge tolerance for the post-truth world that we live in. Um, there are so many myths about asylum seekers that one hardly knows where to start. Um, I think you're all aware of this phenomenon of post-truth. Uh, I might recall the, uh, the inauguration of President Trump uh, that was announced by his uh, press officer, Sean um, Spicer, to be the largest inaugural uh, attendance ever in the history of the American Republic or the history of the entire universe. <laughs> it was objectively false. Thank goodness for CCTV cameras um, and photographs. It was objectively not true. But Anne Conway Tyler, who I sympathise with the job she's got to do, but nonetheless, she said, don't criticise Sean Spicer in making that statement. He was simply providing an alternative fact. <laughs> now, there is no such thing as an alternative fact. A fact is a fact. There may be other facts which alter your view if you're open-minded, you look at the facts generally, but there's no such thing as an alternative fact, and we cannot spin what is untrue into something that becomes true. And we have, I don't know of a more important time than now for us to stand up for the facts and the evidence. The law that I talk about is really Human Rights Law 101. It's very simple, it's not difficult. You do not detain children, you do not detain families that are seeking protection. But there are so many myths in relation to asylum seekers that it's, it's very hard to know where to start. It is not illegal to arrive by boat having paid a people smuggler. This is protected by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that Doc Ebert played such a strong role in formulating. Article 14 provides everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum for persecution. I won't go into all of the myths and mythologies. Um, they are very troubling. But I think what I ask of students at a school as fine as this one is think about the statements that are made by politicians, by some segments of the media. Read it carefully and think about whether the evidence and facts support it. Think independently. And I think one of the things that one most gains from a good education, and I'm sure you're getting that here at the, at the Friends School, is independence of thought and critical analysis. I don't mean critical in the negative sense, but critical in the sense that you think about what you're reading and you think independently as to whether or not it's the truth. Because it is the truth that I think we have to fight very hard for um, at the moment. And I think the, co the confusion and the collusion of the idea that asylum seekers are Muslim terrorists is a, is a disgraceful distortion of reality. And I should say that one of our finest public servants um, Duncan Lewis stood up for that principle before Senate estimates just a couple of uh, months ago, uh, to the derision, I might add, of some of the right-wing press. But we need people of that calibre to stand up for what we know to be the truth. But I'd like to finish, if I may, by um, saying what do I think is the way forward? How do we go forward? One is I think we have to speak up. It's crucial. If you think clearly, you read the evidence, Think for yourselves and then speak up and use whatever avenues you have. The school newsletter, write an op-ed for the local newspaper, join your local groups. Get your facts right. If you get them wrong, you will be pilloried. You will be, uh, you will be shot down very quickly. Do your homework. Get the facts right. Understand a little bit about the basic principles of the law and speak up and be active. From a legal perspective, I'd like to propose that it's time we revisited a Charter of Human Rights in Australia. Um, Victoria has a Charter of Rights, the ACT has a Charter of Rights, and there's some discussion now. Uh, in Queensland, the government is currently drafting the Bill of Rights, and I understand there's a political commitment here in Tasmania, which I see as enormously encouraging. Even the Northern Territory is thinking about this. But we're not seeing the debate at the federal level, and that's where I think we need to take our energies into the future. We've tried. You might recall that um, the Brennan Report, Father Frank Brennan, did a very comprehensive survey across Australia, talking to all sorts of Australians across the political spectrum, to say, do we need a Charter of Rights in Australia to articulate the human rights very simple ones, right to freedom of speech, right not to be detained without charge or trial, right to freedom of movement, independence of the judiciary and so on. 
Very simple principles, it hasn't got to be a difficult document. He found that overwhelmingly Australians supported the idea of a Charter of Rights, and he made that recommendation to the then Labour government, which in principle supported it, but really balked at the, at the final hurdle and, and chose not to introduce one. Um, I think it's time we looked again at a Charter of Rights. Every country that we care to compare ourselves with um, has a Bill or Charter of Rights. Obviously, the United States has a constitutionally entrenched Bill of Rights. I'm not optimistic enough to think that we will get that in the short term. And I think in Australia we have to build slowly. I think we need a Charter that's the so-called dialogue model that Victoria has. In other words, not to impinge upon the power of Parliament, because it is sovereign and Australians believe in Parliament. Um, and believe in the importance of representative democracy. Uh, there's a fear of activist judges. I think it's misplaced, but nonetheless it does exist in Australian political environments. But if we were to adopt something similar to the Victorian model, where a breach of human rights will be something that the court will comment on or say that a particular uh, factual circumstance breaches the uh, breaches the Ch Charter of Human Rights and then sends it back to Parliament to repair the defect, that means you're giving or leaving sovereignty with Parliament where it rightly belongs and you haven't got judges declaring laws to be invalid. It's a relatively weak model, it's not everything one would want, but I think it's something that we can talk about as an experiment. If it doesn't work, you simply repeal the legislation. But no country that's ever enacted a Human Rights Act has ever repealed it, despite political concerns about elements of it. So I don't think a lot of damage could be done. Um, but I'm also realistic. We're having great trouble in Australia, even getting rid of the race clause in the Constitution or in enacting some form of constitutional recognition of our First Nations peoples. And as you, I said earlier, the Uluru Statement from the Heart has been, and all it's uh, suggesting is an advisory voice to Parliament, even that has been rejected out of hand. If we can't achieve that constitutional change, I think to achieve constitutional change for a charter is going to be even more difficult. So let's go for what's achievable, which I think is a legislated charter, very like the Victorian model, or the New Zealand model, or the Canadian or the British models, where we could at least get a start and to start to, start to speak the language of human rights. Um, that is my concern, that we in Australia are not speaking that language, we're not uh, um, constrained by our charters to ensure that we breach, that we, we, we respect those human rights. So to conclude then, I am distressed that we seem to have moved so far from that common humanity and compassion by that Australian family to a Viennese family in the 30s. We seem to have lost that somehow and we've become uh, much more obsessed with uh, perhaps misplaced emphasis on national security, we need to think about the importance of our individual rights and the rights of the community as a whole. But in particular, of course, I think we need to express that compassion to those people that have sought our protection uh, from egregious human rights breaches. So thank you very much indeed.